Good morning, church family. It is so good to see you um, joining us live this morning via Facebook. I pray that you've had a productive week despite the circumstances, and I hope that our time together today will bring you some peace and comfort. If you're joining us live today, please drop a comment in the comment section below and, and tell us good morning, and we will try to interact with you as much as we possibly can today. And as always, if you have a prayer need, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know what those needs are, and um, we will continue to pray for those people in those situations as you make us aware of them. In the way of announcements this morning, we want to remind you that beginning this week on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m., we will have mornings with the ministers, and that is a time of devotion, a time to catch up with one another to see how uh, each other are doing and a time of prayer. We will send out more information about that this week, but we do want to make you aware of that. We also have seven families from the Adulting Connect group who are available to run errands for anybody who has a compromised immune system or is in the elderly population who might not want to get out. Um, and so if you have a need uh, and if we can run errands for you, uh, please contact Joanna Sacco and we will make arrangements um, so that you have everything that you need. This morning, if you are watching with your family, we invite you to give them a hug, to share the peace of Christ with them, or if you're watching alone this morning, we invite you to comment below and share the peace of Christ with those around you in a virtual neighborhood. Uh, we welcome you to worship. Thank you for joining us live. Please join us if you are able to sing hymn 122, Tell Me the Story of Jesus.
Please join me in prayer this morning. Lord God, we are thankful that even though we can't get together physically, that we are still one in spirit, and we know that you are present among us today. We praise you in the midst of uncertainty and strife because you are a good God, and you watch over us and you are with us. Remind us today, Jesus, that even though this may feel like an isolated and lonely time in our world, that we are never alone because you are with us. Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was Jesus who was truly isolated so that we would never have to be. We're so thankful for Jesus who takes away our sins and draws us ever closer into your loving arms. In the midst of a deadly situation marked by agony and pain, what was happening was the ability for life to spring forth for the power of sin to be defeated, and for grace and love to reign. I pray that in the midst of this desperate situation we find ourselves in, that your church would continue to be a place of life where sin and death are defeated, and love guides the way. Help us to be that light in the darkness as we pray how you taught us, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Joyce, for that beautiful song this morning. As I introduce our time of offering, I want to begin by saying thank you and tell each of you just how inspired it was, how inspired I was, how inspiring it was for all of our ministry staff to see so many of you sending your gifts by mail, dropping by the church, dropping your gifts in the drop box, and uh, the number of people who gave online. It says to us that you believe in your church. It tells us that you take a lot of pride in the mission and ministry of the First Baptist Church in Elkin. As we've said before, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know how long we're going to be connecting together and worshiping as an online community. So your gifts continue to sustain our ministry and enable us to do the work that God has called us to do here in Elkin. So as I shared last week, I invite you now to go to elkinfbc.com and offer your gift to our church. Uh, you can go to the, to the desk, grab a checkbook, an envelope, and a stamp, and give just like you would any other Sunday morning. And of course, if you are symptom-free, we invite you to stop by the church this week and place your gift in the drop box in Sherry's office. Wherever you are, may you bow your heads and join with me as I offer the offertory prayer this day. Oh God, you are the giver of every good gift. As your children, Lord, we truly don't own anything. We are simply stewards of all of the many blessings and things that you have given to us. So Lord, I pray that during this time of offering that we will all be good and generous stewards of whatever financial blessings that you have given to us. Lord, today I especially pray for those who are struggling in these tough economic times. May you grant them comfort. May you make provisions for them. May you send resources their way, God, that will enable them to move forward in these challenging days. For all who can give today, O oh God, we believe in our church that to whom much is given, much is indeed required. So may you take whatever gifts are given today, from the widow's might to the largest sum, and may you use every penny to mobilize the ministry and the mission of this church. May you use these tithes and offerings, O Lord, to bless our church, and bless our church, O Lord, so that we will in all things and in every way be a blessing to others. We offer this prayer today in the generous and in the gracious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 46. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the order of service that we sent out to many of you and was posted on Facebook, our play school director, Miss Pat Eaton, was providing a special music for us on the flute, and she was unable to be with us this morning, and we look forward to her coming and sharing her gift on another Sunday. I want to say this morning that I have been so impressed by how well you all are adapting, probably better than we are, to the new ways of being the church. Last week I commented about how empty it was for us to preach and to sing and to lead worship in a sanctuary filled with empty pews. And Miss Lois West commented on the Facebook thread that from her vantage point the sanctuary was full. I want to say that all of your comments, they all warm our hearts and souls and they motivate us and they connect with us in in profound ways and we look forward to reading them after service. But Miss Lois... You are right. We are together today, united by the power of the Holy Spirit that has always penetrated beyond these walls. Today, if you're just joining us in our Lenten series, we are reflecting on the last words of Jesus from the cross. And today we progress to the fourth word from the cross, which is found in both Mark and Matthew's gospel. Jesus cried out, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? These words mark a change in tone from the Jesus that we have known in the other Gospels thus far. The talkative Jesus illustrated in the Gospels of Luke and John is far more silent when we come to the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. But what Jesus does say on the cross in these Gospels get our attention. You have all heard the phrase, don't question God. You've heard it quoted that God will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then we get to the cross and Jesus asks a question that really just turns our world upside down. Jesus, the second person in the beloved Trinity, has the audacity to question the heavenly parent. It is no surprise that Matthew's Matthew's passion narrative happens in the dark. Because it really doesn't get any darker than this. From noon, the narrative reads, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus echoed this great question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was a long three hours. We don't know what all transpired in those hours. We can just assume that these were the longest three hours of Jesus' life. Matthew's gospel, it is a dark and bloody gospel. It begins with the story of Herod slaughtering innocent children. The Christ child escapes death only to die a bloody and violent death on the cross a few decades later. This is dark, isn't it? when it appears that there is a disconnect between the triune powers that be, when it appears that the Creator has lost touch with the created, when it appears that the Incarnation is dying and the Creator is silent, when we find ourselves hearing Jesus' proclamation of forsakenness and asking ourselves, who is in charge? Is anyone in charge anymore? When Jesus echoes these words, the ship is beyond taking on water. The ship seems to be sinking, and there is nothing that anyone can do about it. Jesus is not supposed to be talking like this, we think. This is the one who always has just the right parable at just the right time. The one who should be forgiven the crowd and forgiving thieves and making diligent arrangements for his mother and the beloved disciple, as was the case in the other Gospels. I mean, sure, the psalmist David talked this way. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long must I bear pain in my soul? And Job talked this way. How long will you torment me and break me into pieces? Are you not ashamed to wrong me? 
I call aloud, but there is no justice. We talk this way from time to time. But not you, Jesus. Not now, especially with all that we are dealing with in the world. Not now, as the number of coronavirus cases worldwide tops 300,000. The case of, cases have doubled in a week. And there are twice as many deaths. And here Jesus is talking like this from the cross. Seems like just yesterday that we were all sitting around our Christmas trees hearing the nativity narratives read, reflecting on the meaning of God with us and imagining a precious, soft-skinned little infant in a manger. And I probably said something about Jesus wading and diving headfirst into our existence. But until we see Jesus on the cross asking our questions and dying our death, we haven't fully embraced the meaning of what it means for God to dive headfirst into the sea of human pain and suffering and for the heavenly parent to endure the loss of God's only son. So the question that emerges for us today on the fourth Sunday in our Lenten journeys is how do we find any hope in the nightmare of the cross? When I was in divinity school, I was told that there are some occasions where you just need to tell the story, but make sure that you tell the whole story. And I believe when we tell the whole story, these haunting words of Jesus bring great inspiration and hope and comfort to the lives of the church. So first, let me state the obvious. After spending three hours on the cross, already exhausted by the time that he arrived, Jesus is feeling physical and social abandonment. His disciples have fled. In the gospel, the women are at a distance. The beloved disciple isn't mentioned. It was more than social distancing. This was more than social isolation. This was social rejection. Mentally, emotionally, and physical isolation, they can all send us into very dark places. But the darkest moments in our lives come when we feel and experience and sense spiritual isolation. And so it was for Jesus. How could the incarnation of God experience spiritual isolation? Well, Jesus was fully human. Jesus was fully divine. But if Jesus couldn't feel spiritual isolation, then he wasn't fully human. On the cross, Jesus cries out a question, but God is silent. No great booming voice crying out to him from the cloud like when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was the silence of God that led Jesus to cry out, and it is the silence of God that Jesus receives. So today we ask ourselves, what are we to do when it seems that God is silent? A story is told of a lady who met with her pastor and she had all of these things that she needed to say to God. She had all of these questions for God. She even had some advice for God. She had some things that she just wasn't quite sure that she could say to God. She had all of these thoughts about God abandoning her, questions about why God hadn't fixed all of these things that she had been praying for for so many years. She said, Pastor, what am I supposed to do with all of this stuff that is inside of my soul? With all of these questions that continue to plague me, and her pastor, calm and sincere as could be, looked over his glasses and said, Sister, just tell God about it. God can take it. When God is silent, we need not be silent. Jesus cried out into the silence, My God, my God. And when Jesus said those words, he was acknowledging that God was still there. Perhaps this is why some of our greatest spiritual partners in the faith have embraced the silence of God. Because they've come to know that even in the silent abyss, God is there. Not only that, but just as the heavenly parent grieved the pain of the son Jesus, we are all sons and daughters of the living God. And God hurts when we hurt. God experiences our pain. One priest says that in 70 years of contemplation, God has been largely silent, but he never stopped crying out to God because 
He knows that God is there. We tend to think that Mother Teresa's spiritual life would have been filled with all confidence and enthusiasm and joy. But we shouldn't be surprised that someone who spent her life with suffering poor people and with death all around her lived with a troubled spiritual life, often wrestling with the silence of God. I read this week that she experienced a terrible darkness, quote, and emptiness in her life, beginning when she joined the destitute and dying of Calcutta. And she only came to love the darkness after she took on a discipline of smiling at God in the emptiness. Because even in the emptiness and the darkness, God is still there working in ways that are beyond our ability to fully grasp. What does it mean when we express ourselves like the psalmist, like Job, like Jesus the Christ? Does it mean that we are lacking faith? When Jesus cried these words from the cross, does it mean that he's suddenly questioning his mission and his ministry and his purpose in the world? Did Jesus start believing that he would have been better off silent, siding with Pilate and his cronies or that he should have run away with the disciples when the guards emerged in Gethsemane? No. Jesus' words from the cross prove that he wasn't just a puppet fulfilling prophecy. He was an approximately, approximate 33-year-old fully Jewish man of deep faith. And he knew that the Father was still there. And he calls on his name not once, but twice. This morning we ask, does feeling abandoned mean that we have actually been abandoned? Sometimes I like to allow my little boy to wonder. Katie and I, far from the water of course, have let him walk down the beach and explore the edge of the dunes on his own. We were enjoying a backyard campfire Thursday evening and he was eating an apple and when he finished his apple, he walked off into the darkness to the edge of the woods to toss the core to the deer. And all I could see in the darkness was his bright little shirt. But I knew right where he was. But there is that moment when shock sets in and he does think that he is all alone and there's nobody else out there. But he is not alone, maybe turned loose, perhaps separated from us, but he is not abandoned. We are there. Yet his emotions, the very raw emotions of life, they are so very real. Even when the heavenly parent knows right where we are and exactly what we are going through, the relationship between God and creation may look like a silent dark abyss, but the biblical record promises us that God is still there. And like Mother Teresa, we can smile in the darkness, a smile that the pain of life at times reduces to just a grin, but we can smile in the darkness because my God, my God is still there. Scholar Margaret Farley writes that Christianity is therefore not a religion obsessed with pain. It is a religion of resistance and a religion of hope. The point of the cross, she writes, is not finally suffering and death. It is rather that a relationship holds. I believe when we consider the source of Jesus' words on the cross, it becomes even more clear to us that Jesus' relationship with the Father holds. A good student of the larger canon of Scripture knows that Jesus wasn't just crying out the first thing that came to his mind. And I want to be cautious here because I believe his words were indicative of his emotional and spiritual state at the time. I, I didn't want to go to this point in the sermon too quickly because we do need to sit with Jesus in his pain and in his anguish. And we need to let his pain and anguish speak to ours in times of great isolation and trouble. But you see, Jesus had spent his life exercising the spiritual disciplines, learning from the best teachers in the Jewish traditions, singing those rich psalms. And now on the cross he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Which is a direct quote from Psalm 22. It's been said that there is a psalm for everything that we go through in life. 
And surely that was the case for Jesus on the cross. The parallels between the anguish of the psalmist and this experience of Jesus on the cross are very clear. Psalm 22, 7, for instance, reveals that all who mock me shake their heads. Psalm 22, 18 says, They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And the psalmist also cried out in the very first verse, the prelude to this psalm, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the crowds who were there that day, they didn't get it. In fact, they heard Eli, Eli. That's the Hebrew word offered in Matthew's gospel. Mark says Eloi, Eloi. But they heard Eli, Eli, my God, my God. And they thought that Jesus was calling out for Elijah. They thought that Jesus was responding to the taunts, beckoning someone to come and save him from the cross. But for those who knew the scriptures, knew the far-reaching effects of Jesus' cry from the cross, God was silent. Jesus was empty. But from the great void of his heart came the powerful words of the psalmist. Even when darkness comes to our lives, when I say to you, amazing grace, your next thought is, how sweet the sound. When I say to you that I will cling to the old rugged cross, your next thought is, and exchange it someday for a crown. When I say to you that I heard an old, old story, your next thought is when a Savior came from glory. When I say to you, the Lord is my shepherd, your first thought is, I shall not want. When I say to you, our Father who art in heaven, your next thought is, hallowed be thy name. Yes, a Hebrew who heard Jesus' words certainly felt his pain, but they also saw and heard his faith. Psalm 22 begins with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it erupts after that into a psalm, into a song of praise. But you, Lord, do not be far from me, Psalm 22 says. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of dogs. And he writes, For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from me, but has listened to his cry for help. The psalmist goes on to write, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Psalm 22 proclaims, All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Walter Brueggemann writes that the psalmist, speaking for every person of faith, prays in the abyss of futility, but anticipates deliverance into new life by the faithfulness of God. It is that trust in the abyss of alienation that becomes, he writes, the seedbed of Easter newness. We can smile into the abyss. We can smile into the darkness and the emptiness and into the silence because we know that for Jesus indeed and for us that God is still there. On the cross, Jesus felt so far away from God and those feelings were real. But on the cross, to quote Will Willimon's words and thank God it's Friday, when Jesus felt so far away from God, he drew so very close to each one of us who have found ourselves experiencing physical, and social, and spiritual abandonment. When we hear these words from the cross, we take great comfort in knowing that God has been right where we are in Jesus Christ. I tell you today that I struggled with the timing of today's text because it seems so dark. It seems so morbid, and there is so much darkness and uncertainty that is overwhelming our world today. But God knew when I made my sermon schedule six months ago that this would be the text for today. God, God knew several months ago that the coronavirus was in the forecast, and we as a church would have to come together and find a way to endure it with God's help. So today I say to you, if you're feeling empty if you're feeling alone, if you're feeling uncertain, today if you feel abandoned, 
because you know that even when God is silent, God hurts with you, God knows your pain, and God knows your heart. God is still there, and God still understands the sense of loss that we feel. Today you may ask, Preacher, how do you know that God is still there? Well, because darkness has never been able to get the last word. Darkness tried to get the last word at Golgotha. And for three days it appeared that darkness had won. But the darkness has always been short-lived. And I suppose that that is the greatest reason that I am able to grin and to smile at the darkness. Because the darkness always means that Easter is on the horizon. The prelude to Easter, it was a song of lament on the cross. But in due time, the song of lament will undoubtedly erupt into a psalm or a song of praise. So church, I say to you today, hang in there. Some say that we're in for a long ride as we adjust to these new norms and do all that we can to combat this pandemic together. Some experts say that there are lonely and even darker days that may be ahead for us. But keep praying to God. Scream at God if you need to. I promise God can, can take it. But whatever you do, don't stop crying out. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me. Those words are a little spring that have the potential to become a rushing river of faithfulness, just as they were for the psalmist and for Jesus. And to borrow Brueggemann's words one more time, those words are indeed the seedbed for Easter newness. In church, that's why that we can smile today in the darkness. Let's bow our heads together wherever you are. May I lead us today in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is my goal today to practice what I have preached. Eternal God, I am angry today. I miss the laughter and fellowship of my church. I miss Catherine Powell's hugs. I miss Charlie Tucker's sense of humor. I miss Frank Hendrick picking up my little boy and making him laugh. I miss Peggy's breakfast and the warm fellowship. Lord, I miss praying over the choir before worship. I miss having conversations about my sermon with Liz Bacon and so many others. Lord, I'm angry today because Joyce Billings and Betty Tucker and Herbert Adams and Layla Cox and so many others are in facilities where they can't have any visitors. Lord, I'm sad today for my friends who have lost their jobs and others who have lost so much of their net, their net worth. Lord, today we are scared because of a pandemic that many believe will soon threaten every community in America. And Lord, I'm heartbroken for the families of those who have died, many of whom couldn't even have public funerals. Lord, today I'm sure that our listeners and viewers share some of my emotions and concerns. So Lord, today we cast our cares upon you. And Lord, we also acknowledge that while you may not give us the answers that we demand to every question, God, we know that you are still there and it is for that reason that we continue to call upon your name. Not only that, O oh God, but you are working in ways beyond our ability to comprehend. Lord, I can see your face in the creativity and in the resilience of your church. Lord, I see your movement in families coming together to support one another, those who are rediscovering the value of those intimate relationships and the time that we have together. Lord, I feel the world uniting in an effort aimed at healing. And God, as your church, we know that resurrection comes to us in all kinds of ways. So, Lord, my prayer today is that even with broken, troubled, and fearful hearts, may you help us to smile at the darkness, because even now, a new day is already breaking in our lives, in our church, in our nation, and in our world. 
Give us the strength, O God, to endure and to persevere in all things together. We pray together in the powerful, in the precious, and in the healing and resurrected name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today for our invitation and time of response, our minister of music, Lance Newman, is going to come and sing Amazing Grace. I invite you to sing with him if you want. I invite you to cast your cares upon the Lord. Pray and say to God whatever it is that you need to say and know that God is listening. May God fill your broken hearts. May God bless you and may God keep you. And may God touch you and anoint you as we lift our voices in song together. Yes. <laughs> 
May we go believing that the time is now to face the challenges of this world with the light of Christ. Go believing that the moment is right for us to speak words of love to those most isolated in our lives. Go believing that the church isn't here in a building, but the church is the people who serve through whatever means available to us. Go believing that the time has come for the church of Jesus Christ to lead in the world. So cast your cares upon the Lord and know that darkness never has gotten the last word. May God bless you and keep you. May God protect you until we meet again. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.